and then where you are going chapter three. Okay. So we left off here, yes? Okay. So uh, we've been talking about acids and bases. And so now what we wanna do is we wanna talk a little bit about buffers. And we kind of talked a little bit about buffers in lab two. Um, but now what we wanna do is we wanna really kind of dig into them a little bit and sort of clear up a couple of things. I wanna make sure some pitfalls that you guys don't fall into when it comes to buffers themselves. Remember a buffer is always defined as a solution and its only goal is to resist pH changes. Now, the important thing to understand is it doesn't, does not maintain neutrality. That's the most common mistake that a general bio student makes. Like I asked them a question, something like this. So define a buffer. Oh, it maintains neutral pH. No, that's wrong. A buffer maintains pH period, regardless of where you are on the pH scale. For instance, I can create for you an acidic buffer that will keep your buffer, your pH around two. That's an acid, that's not neutral, right? I can also make for you a buffer that's a basic buffer and that'll keep your pH like around 13, right? That's a base, that's not neutral. And then of course we can make our neutral buffers as well. And that's what we normally run into. Now, the reason why we normally run into these neutral buffers is largely because most of actually what we have is, um, is neutral body fluids, right? So our physiological pH is 7.4. And so the majority of the things we're interested in studying, like enzymes, for instance, are all generally in and around that sort of neutralist range, which is the reason why we tend to work predominantly with neutral buffers, not because buffers maintain neutrality, but because those are the the conditions that most of our enzymes that we're interested in studying live and function at. So then ultimately then when you take a look at a buffer, right, a buffer is composed of two different molecules, acidic molecules and basic molecules. And so ultimately when you add a base, what's gonna happen is it's going to neutralize that base with its hydrogen ion. So the acidic components are gonna neutralize that base, keeping the pH the same. If you add an acid, then the basic components of the buffer will neutralize the acid and keep the pH the same. Now, the reason why this is important is because of this. So this is a graph where we take a look at the buffering range of a particular buffer. And we've calibrated this buffer to buffer between four and six, a pH of four and six. So slightly acidic, but the reason why we buffer this range is because typically enzymes are active in specific pH ranges. So here's an enzyme, right? And the idea is we want this enzyme to do its job. So ultimately then we wanna make sure that um, that we have as much activity from this enzyme as possible, right? It doesn't help us if this enzyme is only functional in very narrow conditions and for a very short period of time, right? If we need this enzyme to do a lot of work, we need a lot of productivity, high output, then we want conditions, we want this enzyme to be robust and productive in a broad range of conditions so it can get a lot of work done for us, right? And that's exactly what a buffer will do. So for instance, let's say this enzyme is only gonna be active in a pH of six. Oh, excuse me, four to six. That's its range of activity. So let's take a look at this then. So here we have on the y-axis our pH and then on the x-axis we have a base, we're adding a base. You could always also easily just add an acid as well. And so in this case, we're gonna add a certain volume of base and we're gonna measure the pH. And in a good buffer, when you measure that pH, you'll notice that you haven't barely even just eked over a pH of four. So you're like way, way early in your pH range, okay? So this enzyme would be active at this point. Now, what if we add twice as much base? Well, in this particular case, you're gonna notice that you kind of scooch up just a bit, but you haven't even gotten to five yet. And you're already twice as much base. Now, what if we add three times as much base? Well, that's crazy, first of all, right? Triple the amount of base, that's like a ton 
of extra base. Well, let's see what happens. Now you're just about at five, but you're right in the midpoint of your range. So your enzyme's still active. Oh, let's get crazy, right? Let's add four times as much base. Now, by the way, at this particular point, you're talking about, I mean, if, you're at, if your volumes and your concentrations are swinging so wildly that they are in you know, up and down a, a fourfold amount, then you're talking about like riding the stock market without any of the protective measures. I mean, we're talking about the 19th century stock market, right? When you basically were rich one second and dirt poor the next. I mean, and there was no safety net. There was no hope, right? right? What we have now is a fairly domesticated wild animal of the stock market. The stock market was a brutal, rabid beast back in the 19th century, which is the reason why a lot of people lost their shirts. But even now, four times as much base, you're now over five, but you still got some headroom there, don't you? You're not even, I mean, you're kind of getting close to six, but you're well within your range. And it's not until you get up to about five times the amount of base that you actually break out of your buffering range. At this particular point, what that means is that we, I use a term um, that you broke your buffer, right? So when you kind of exceed its buffering capacity, it's no longer able to buffer against wild pH changes. And you notice the second you break your buffering range, notice what happens to the pH. It's not linear, it's exponential. It skyrockets, right? So what would this look like without a buffer? Well, what it would look like without a buffer is the pH would basically skyrocket very quickly. And then guess what? You would add some acid and then it would crash just as bad, right? And then it would go skyrocket and crash and skyrocket and crash, skyrocket. I mean, so that's what it would look like on a minute by minute basis, depending on whether you're adding acid or base. Kind of difficult, right? to get your business done, because basically what this means is the enzyme would be on for just this little piece, this little period of time right there. That's when it would be on and then it'd be off. And then as it crashed, it'd be on just a flicker, a glimmer, and then and it'd be off. And then once it came back up, it'd be on and it'd be off. And then it'd be on and it'd be off. And it'd be on and it'd be off. And you, you can't get business done that way, right? You're either in it or you're not, right? Fish or cut bait, show up and do your job or retire, <laughs> right? Um, and that's kind of what it's like. So what that basically means then, anywhere you're in this buffering range right here is the area of active enzyme. So that means then that this enzyme can tolerate lots of flexibility and variation in environment and circumstances and still be active. Why? Because of our buffer. And so that's an important idea of how buffers work and what they do for us. Now, what about our buffer? Remember I said our physiological buffer is a pH of 7.4. Uh, that's basically your body fluids. So if you were to take blood plasma and pH, it'd be right around 7.4. And we like to maintain it around 7.4. Now, obviously does it ebb and flow? It does. It kind of rises and falls and rises and falls. But for the most part, we keep it fairly steady. And this is basically our buffer system. This is our carbonate buffer system. This is the one that keeps our steady pH. So basically carbon dioxide, which is surrounds us, right? Where it's part of our atmosphere. So we're breathing in carbon dioxide. When it basically unites with water, it'll turn into carbonic acid. Notice the hydrogens in the front. This is an acid. Right? So it's going to be able to liberate one of those hydrogens by definition. Donating a hydrogen is going to create acidity. right? And so when the carbonic acid dissociates, it becomes bicarb, bicarbonate, right? which is of sodium bicarbonate fame as baking soda. right? We know it better as baking soda. And then, of course, one hydrogen ion. And that's where your acidity comes from. But guess what? If you're breathing too much CO2 and you're increasing your acidity like way too much, then you gotta sort of readjust that, don't you? You gotta get that back down to your 7.4. So notice all these reactions are reversible, right? That gives that reversibility of biological reactions. And the reason is because from time to time, you're gonna be taking in too much CO2 and you're gonna be needing to get rid of some of that excess hydrogen ion. Why? Because you're getting too acidic, right? Your 7.4 is going down to 7.2, 7.0, right? So you're starting to get a little too acidic. That's gonna start messing up your enzymes. 
and it's going to create massive global physiological dysfunction if you don't correct this quickly. Okay. So what do you do in order to get rid of it? Well, it's pretty simple. You just basically back it up. You do the reverse reaction, right? So if you favor the reverse reaction, then going in this direction, your hydrogen ion is going to basically reunite with the bicarb to get you your carbonic acid, which will then ultimately pop off the CO2 from the water, will split itself into CO2 and water. And then in order to get rid of this and make sure that it doesn't go before it again, this is basically one step forward, one step back, then you take the CO2 that you've got and you breathe it out. So when you're hyperventilating and you're building up too much CO2 in your body and it's becoming a problem, the point is just breathe, breathe it out, right? So if you're getting too acidic, breathe it out, breathe out the CO2. If you breathe out the CO2, then it's gonna move everything to the left and then it's gonna reduce your acidity and you're gonna get yourself back to your physiological pH. Now, this is a quick fix, right? Because now we've already talked a little bit about in this one section, two different mechanisms physiologically we have for uh, regulating our pH, right? One is taking the excess hydrogen ion and dumping it on our, on our urine stream, right? Which is the reason why our urine is slightly acidic, coming around six, six and a half or so. That's a long-term thing, right? But if you, your physiology is immediately like out of balance and you have to correct that pH very quickly or bad things are going to happen very soon, you don't want to wait for this hydrogen ion to get put into your urine stream because the filtration process of your kidneys takes time um, and it's not, a, it's not a short term fix for pH rises and falls. It's a long term management system for pH, right? So it's a longitudinal thing. For quick fixes, this is it. The best thing to do is to basically back this up, liberate that CO2 and send it to the lungs, obviously, right? And then breathe it out. And then that would basically reduce the acidity in the short term while you're maintaining more of that even flow long-term with your urine. Okay. You guys just got a heavy dose of physiology right there. Act surprised when you get to AMP2. Actually, we get made to look much more deeper than that in, in AMP2, but that's the gist of it, right? or at least of that particular piece of it. Okay, so that is the end of two. Now then, let us begin three. <clears throat> so at this point, what we've been doing is we have been slowly moving our way up that levels of organization, right? We started off with atomic in chapter two, and then we did that shift to molecular when we started talking about intermolecular forces of attraction. Then we kind of parked a little bit on water uh, to kind of expand that one a little bit. But now we're basically fussing around with these little molecules, right? We have water, which is fairly small, carbon dioxide, which is fairly small. That's not gonna get us where we need to go though, is it? We need to get to building an organism. So what do we need to do? Well, the thing we need to do is we need to start building larger molecules, right? We need to get to the point where we can build proteins and DNA and lipids and carbohydrates, right? Those are essentially the molecules that build living organisms. Matter of fact, uh, kind of like what I did to you guys when uh, I broke you guys down into your atoms and we had our list of 12 atoms, 96% of which was Chon, right? If I do the same thing to you and I say I break you into all of your macromolecules, you only have four categories, right? Every single molecule in your body will all slot into one of four molecules that I just rattled off. It'll either be a nucleic acid, some sort of a lipid, it'll be some sort of a protein, or it'll be some sort of a carbohydrate. That's it. But the problem is those are big molecules, right? DNA molecule, it's made of atoms. We know that, right? But that's a big molecule. So are proteins, those are big molecules. So what we're doing is we're kind of shifting our way up in complexity. We've got small molecules, we've got that one, right? But now we want to get to the macromolecule level. So how do we make more complex molecules that are going to give us the ability to build organisms? In this case, what we really want to do is start building organelles, and then from the organelles, we'll build the cell. Well, in order to do that, and because of the Chan effect, we have to start off with a little bit of organic chemistry. Why? Because organic chemistry <clears throat> is 
is the study of carbon containing molecules. Why carbon? Well, <clears throat> because we already know that 96% is chon, right? And of that chon, most of it is carbon. So if you were to break down Chon and say, who is the dominant one in this group? It would clearly head and shoulders be carbon, like by a lot, right? And so really everything in you and all living organisms are centered around carbon. Now, what are some of the things we know about carbon? Well, first of all, let's start off with something uh, like just break it down. Like uh, what's carbon's valence? How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four, right? So it's got six all together, yes? You fill up the first shell with the first two, you got four left over. And so ultimately when you take a look at carbon, you've got your four valence electrons. Okay. Now, in addition to carbon, I mean, Chon, right? You also have in macromolecules, sulfur and phosphorus as well. And we'll talk a little bit about where those guys come into play in which uh, category of molecules that they come into play. Um, but they're part of this, this, this group as, as well. So now let's take a look, first of all, at our four valence carbon. That basically means it's gonna be able to form four valence electrons or four uh, bonds altogether, right? So every carbon has to form four bonds in order to fill up its outermost shell. Now, if, uh, for instance, we keep it simple because we did this in chapter two, right? We basically say, well, let's pair you up with hydrogen and you're going to have four bonds full of hydrogen, then what have I created? I've created methane, right? But the thing is, uh, that bond, remember, the bonds don't have to be any one thing. They can be anything they want, right? So you can add all sorts of things to carbon that you want, but you have to add four things to each carbon. Well, here's a good question. What if we just added another carbon to one of these carbons? So instead of one carbon, what if we added to something like this? I would have my three left over, fill those guys up with hydrogens, keep it simple. And what have I created? I've created ethane. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Let's do three in a series. Notice the central carbon has four. <clears throat> two of those are taken up by its fellow carbons, so it only has two hydrogens associated with it. What is this one? Propane. Okay. <clears throat> if you have four carbons in a, in a row, that's butane, five, pentane, six, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane, dodecane, so forth. But let's back up for a second. I said octane, right? How many carbons are in the octane chain? Eight. Have you ever seen the term octane before? Oh, yes, you have. How many of you guys have filled up a gas tank? How many of you guys understand what those little numbers mean? So you just pick the cheapest one, right? That's always good to go, especially these days, right? Because it's going to cost you like a million dollars anyway. Um, <laughs> Right, so those ratings, 85, 89, 92, those are, those are octane ratings. Look at it, right? So if you look closely at their little, they have like a little formula on there, how they calculate it, but it's like an octane rating. So octane is actually a component of gasoline. How many of you guys have danced with propane before? Grillers, come on. Somebody's had to grill out there. Grab yourself a blue rhino, right? Or whatever, right? So I just love that name, blue rhino. It's like, that's just and a blue flame, right? So it works on all levels. But anyway, um, so what happens when uh, you light a match to propane? Yeah, we all know that one, right? How about uh, to gas? Because it's just gasoline. Same thing, right? What happens if you light a match to methane? Same thing, right? Cow farts, right? That's basically methane. So we use that methane 
methanol, we can use that as a fuel for some, in some cases, for certain motors. So what do these things all have in common? Well, what these all things have in common is, first of all, is a carbon-hydrogen bond, which basically is very energetic. <clears throat> There's a lot of energy in them. Now, how do you know there's a lot of energy in there, right? So, well, here's a couple of them. These are what's referred to as hydrocarbons. These are molecules that are only made up of carbon and hydrogen. But the question is, like, what kind of an experiment can you do to prove to me that there's energy in these carbon-hydrogen bonds? What would you do? Go get in the chemistry lab and get your little white coat on, your goggles on. Have all these flasks all over the place. All right, kind of hold your tongue to the side. What would you simply do? You pyromaniacs. Very simple. What? Yeah. Right? What happens when you light the match? Explain it to me. Imagine I'm blind. I've never experienced it before. Explain what's happening to me. You light a match to propane or whatever, or gasoline. What happens? What's happening? What? There's a release of heat. Yes, exactly, right? What else? Now I'm blind, right? But I'm not dead, so I can probably feel the heat. So that one I understand, right? What else? Yeah, there's light, right? So there's two different forms of energy coming off of that. And so one of the things actually that goes into this concept of energy is uh, the first law of thermodynamics. And we're gonna talk a little bit, not all three of them, but the first two certainly. But this is one of those universal laws. <clears throat> Everybody obeys it in the universe. What does that law say? No, matter, that's the conservation of mass, which is kind of an application of this. I mean, if you're into Einstein e equals MC squared, technically they're the same, but we're not gonna get into that. Right, this is, technically speaking, this one is energy, same idea, right? Cannot be created nor destroyed. Only what? Transformed, right? So what does that mean? That means that the energy that you just described to me that we're experiencing is equal to the amount of energy that's inside that bond. So the energy that's in this bond has to be equal to all of the energy that's coming out of it, including all the heat that you see and all the light that you see. That has to actually equal 100% of the energy that's into those bonds. Think about that for a second. Think about how much energy is coming off of that flame. First of all, you see light, so it's a lot, it's bright, right? So that's a lot of energy there. And it's hot, and some flames are hotter than others, right? But the two of those together, plus whatever extraneous, unaccounted for sources of energy that we won't worry about because that's more into physics, all of that together is basically what was packed into those itty bitty bonds, which is crazy, right? Which basically means there's a ton of energy in those carbon and hydrogen bonds, a ton of energy in there, right? That's the reason why I say these bonds are energetic. Um, another kind of way, just to get to kind of nuclear physics, not because we're gonna go into that, but just as a G way sort of thing, and as, as a further point to make my point here, is when you're talking about energy, like just the raw energy, there's, I don't know about you guys, but there's nothing more like mind blowing in terms of just how overwhelmingly energetic something is than to see a mushroom cloud. Right, like when you actually sit down and you like watch video of like an atomic bomb going off and you just like, you don't just like, you don't let yourself get, you just watch it and watch everything around it. Watch the shock wave as it basically plows through, I mean, miles and miles and miles of earth and just watch the nature of all of that happening. That energy, all of that, all added together is how much energy was in that small little package. Now, just to let you know, just a little bit of nuclear physics, the way nuclear bombs work 
is that generally speaking, they take advantage of the instability of radioactive materials and their desire to decay naturally. Well, what we found out was there was this idea called critical mass, which a lot of us know about, right? We've heard this term in society. Most of us probably don't actually understand what it means because it's a nuclear physics term, right? But basically what happens is if a piece of mass that is naturally radioactive and already unstable reaches a certain size, basically exacerbating the instability, then it will basically go catastrophic. That's essentially a nuclear chain reaction. So what we did, and part of what bomb strategy is, and this is kind of what um, you know, little boy and fat man was. That's the, those are the two bombs that dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, what those basically were, and our strategy was to take two subcritical pieces of mass, usually plutonium or something like that, where they're radioactive certainly, but they're not chain reactive yet, right? Because they haven't reached that critical mass yet. And then during the process of detonation, the separation mechanism will break down and the two will come together. They will reach super critical point and then they'll become massively unstable and then they'll just go spontaneous chain reaction. Then they'll, what they'll do is they'll release all that energy that's inside the nuclei of that mass. And that energy is what we experience as the mushroom cloud, the actual, atom the actual atomic blast. That's the amount of energy, by the way. <clears throat> when you take a look at one of those mushroom clouds in a piece of mass that's roughly about this big. Think about that for a second. That much energy in a mushroom cloud is coming from a mass that's roughly about that big, a little bit bigger than a softball. That's crazy. That's a crazy amount of energy. Um, and this is kind of like it, right? I mean, it's not quite as catastrophic, but what happens is that amount of energy that you're experiencing is what's inside those bombs. And that's kind of an amazing thing. That's the reason why they're energetic. And that's a really, the reason why I say that, right, is because what's one of the first biological questions of life we have to answer? Our energy plan, right? If you're gonna have an energy plan, one of the first things that when you're gonna sit down to put that together an energy plan, you have to ask yourself, is like, okay, it's great. But where's our energy coming from, right? What's our fuel? So you build a combustion engine, good for you. What's it gonna rain and run on, banana peels, right? I mean, what's the, and where's the energy coming from? So you have to come up with an entire industry, the refining, the fuel industry, right? The going from crude oil to refining it into different types of petrol products and different types of gasolines that are pure enough to be able to run in your combustion engine and not basically turn into tar in there, right? That's basically the entire refinement system. If you're keeping track, the Rockefeller family of notoriously wealthy fame on the East Coast, that's how they made their money. That's how the Rockefellers became um, big, was they were oil refiners. So this is the reason why. This is important, right? Because it's like, okay, if I need energy, then where's my energy? Right? So where is it? I want to know where it is because I want to be able to sort of access that, tap into it so that I can use it for myself. The other thing is also these carbon hydrogen bonds tend to be nonpolar. So this is kind of helpful, right? Because sometimes when you take a look at a molecule and you may not necessarily know what it is, right? Um, but in this particular case, what will happen is you take a look at a molecule and it's like, well, yeah, I don't really know what it is, but I see a lot of carbon hydrogen bonds in there. Chances are, because of this, you're probably looking at, at a nonpolar molecule, okay? Even if you don't know what it is, you know it's in that group, right? That nonpolar grouping. Now, the other thing we also want to do is this is kind of nice, right? I mean, we have these hydrocarbons. We can make these very long carbon chains. <clears throat> but the thing is, can we do more with it, right? Um, by the way, you can kind of hook these guys together however you want. I mean, you can make long chains as much as you want. You can hook these guys together in rings. You can hook them together in multiple rings and fuse them together. Uh, these carbon chains, these backbones, you can do a lot with. And so one of the things I want to just sort of um, let you in on in terms of notation systems, because I use it a lot. So I want you to know what I'm doing is when you take a look at these carbon chains and you draw them out, um, what you're going to see is oftentimes they form kind of like this zigzag line like this. <clears throat> now, why? Remember the tetrahedral shape of water? Remember we said that 
when you have these four, you have to form this tetrahedron and the water only has two bonds, so it's a bent molecule, right? But it kind of had this little pyramid with a little stick on top. Well, whenever you have four slots, which is what you have with most of these shells, right? Because you have four spaces, two each. Um, um, and so when you add this in there, carbon, which, already, which has four slots, has the same shape, that sort of tetrahedral shape. And when you do that, what it happens is you kind of have these hydrogens that kind of stick out like this and like this and like this. And the carbons actually form this sort of tetrahedral shape. See the tetrahedron? Here's the pyramid. And here's the stick on top. This one's upside down. Here's the pyramid here. And there's the stick on top. This one is the pyramid here. There's a stick on top, right? So there's tetrahedrons. And because of that, those carbons kind of have this zigzag shape to them. So what that means is oftentimes when I'm writing a carbon chain, and I do this oftentimes, especially in lipids, I'll just basically abbreviate it like this. Where each intersection, so that's a carbon, 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 that's a carbon. Okay. And then unless otherwise noted, it's assumed that these are all full of hydrogens. Okay. And you see that a lot. This is kind of a shorthand. Or like if it's a ring, you'll see something like this. Right, where each one of these intersections is a carbon, it just basically turned itself into a ring. Okay. So you'll see that a lot. Now, here's the question this sort of chain of carbons, whether it's a ring or just a big long chain, is what's referred to as a backbone. Now, sometimes organic chemists are specifically looking at the backbone, sometimes they don't really care about what the backbone is. And so they have a habit of using kind of a generic shorthand to, to, to basically refer to some sort of a carbon containing backbone that they don't really care about. And they usually use the letter R for that, okay? Now, why do I say that? Because what we wanna do is we wanna say, okay, this is great, this is all nice, we got this carbon chain, but you know, other than a fuel, what else can we do with it, right? Because last time I checked, um, you don't wanna light yourself on fire and you don't want all of your carbon containing molecules to blow up. It's a bad look. For your DNA to blow up on you. Um, so then how do we get more functional uh, characteristics out of these? Well, we use what's called functional groups. These are essentially groups of atoms that have specific functions. Now, think about it this way. And I'm going to wax kind of holiday on you guys a little bit. Um, I'm going to go with the Christmas tree because, well, the holidays just passed. Right. And so we've all probably been around in life long enough to have seen a Christmas tree or two in our lifetime. Right. And they're basically the same thing, aren't they? Some sort of a tree. It could be anything. It could be a fir, a pine, whatever. You know, some people are really, they really get their tree geek going. And they get all these crazy different, you know, it's like, oh yeah, the Douglas fir is the best one. It's like, okay, it's, it's a tree, but anyway, right? So what really, but not all Christmas trees are the same, right? You can do some wildly very different types of Christmas trees, but it's not the tree that determines that, is it? It's how you decorate the tree that determines that, right? So you can get some trees that are just like very kind of like winter snowland, you know, because they're like all white and blue or whatever, you know? Um, and they kind of have this really kind of winter wonderland effect to them. And you can get some that are very warm and inviting like an old home cottage or something like that with deep maroons and gold or something like that, right? You can get uh, a Hanukkah tree, for instance. Uh, There's some folks who are interfaith, uh, interfaith families, and they, they celebrate both Hanukkah and Christmas. You can do a Hanukkah tree if you wanted. Um, you can do a Valentine's tree, by the way, think of tomorrow, right? So don't forget. Um, right, right, right. So, I mean, you can, you can do anything you want on a tree. You can make the tree say anything you want. So it all depends not so much on the tree, 
but it depends on what you hang on the tree, right? So in this analogy, the tree is our backbone. It's our carbon backbone. Are there different types of backbones? Sure. Are there different types of Christmas trees? Sure. I mentioned a couple, right? There's pines, there's firs, there's whatever, right? So there's different types of trees. But what really makes them stand out functionally and differ from one to another is what you hang on them, those ornaments, right? So what are the chemical ornaments? Well, these are the chemical ornaments. Now, just to let you know, uh, going through the chemistry, and we don't go through the chemistry, we just go through the definitions of them. Uh, functional groups is basically OCHEM2, right? So where each uh, individual functional group has its own chapter and you learn about all the hydroxyl chemistry and the things you can do with hydroxyls and all the carbonyl chemistry and all the things you can do with that. It's a lot of fun um, if you're a chemistry nerd. Uh, and I was at uh, UC Davis when I did it and I loved it. It's also important for us though, right? Because we're made out of carbon. And what are we building? Carbon containing bonds, which means we need to understand some organic chemistry. Okay, so we're still kind of in organic chemistry uh, mode. So let's go ahead and break it down. Let's talk about the first one, the hydroxyl group. So the hydroxyl group is basically defined by an OH group. Now, the reason why you don't see the line in there is that this is a package deal, right? So it's not oxygen, hydrogen, it's OH, that's hydroxyl. They are a package deal. They go with each other. Um, and so what you have is basically some sort of a carbon backbone it could be a long chain, it could be a carbon ring, it could be anything you want, we don't really care. In organic chemistry, when we don't care about what it is exactly, we call it R, okay? Why? Because what we're interested in is this guy right here, the functional group, the hydroxyl group. Now, typically speaking, when we take a look at them, I'm gonna give you an example of this. I'm gonna draw this guy right here, two carbons connected to each other, full of otherwise hydrogens, which is what? We just saw this one, ethane, right? We've already established that it's a hydrocarbon, right? We've already established that this can go boom if we light it. Now, what happens if we add our OH group to that? Well, let's go ahead and just change it out. It doesn't really matter which carbon we put this on. I'm gonna fill it up with hydrogens, except for this guy here, we're gonna put a hydroxyl group on there. What have we made now? Ethanol, right? And the all ending suffix betrays the alcohol. So these are alcohols. Matter of fact, what is ethanol? If I told you guys go out and give me some ethanol and bring it back, what would you bring? come back with? Not rubbing alcohol, that's a different alcohol. That's isopropyl. So it's a propane, propane with, a, with a center piece to it. What? That's acetone. Hang on to that one. So that's a, that's a different functional group. Oh, I can guarantee you guys have, have had your fair share of ethanol. Yeah, right? It's drinking alcohol. So everybody's had a pretty harsh exam in the past where you had to basically go hit the pub and sort of drink it away. Um, it had to annihilate that experience a little bit, right? <laughs> and we've all had some of those, right? But that's drinking alcohol. If you add an, an OH2 methane, right? One of those four hydrogens, and you swap that out with a hydroxyl, that becomes methanol, right? That's wood alcohol. Um, then you have propanol. That's where the isopropyl comes in, by the way. That's a uh, propanol, is, it's not a straight chain. You've got, you've got iso means that uh, you've kind of got a center. It's like in the center, like a T shape. The same idea, but it's a T-shape instead of a straight chain. Um, butanol, pentanol, heptanol, hexanol. So these are all alcohols because they have this hydroxyl group on it. Right now, think about it. Just that one little package deal, hydroxyl group, basically changed the chemistry from something that's combustible and poisonous, by the way, to something you can drink. Okay, so those are hydroxyl groups. Um, and they form the alcohol groups. The other one is the carbonyl. Now, this is an important one. And this is a situation where you have a carbon double bonded to oxygen. And there's two different versions. Of this. That's why I want to finish this out, right? There is a version which is called a ketone. And in this particular version, what's happening is you have a carbon chain coming into the carbonyl, 
you hit this carbon double bond and then there's a carbon chain coming out, okay? That's referred to as a ketone. The other version of this is an aldehyde, which is you have a carbon chain coming into the carbonyl, but it terminates in a hydrogen. So like for instance, if you were to take a look at, uh, let's stick with propane, right? So if you were to take a look at propane, so here's a carbon, here's a carbon, here's my carbon. I'm gonna put my carbonyl right there in the middle. And if this is basically otherwise full of hydrogens, then what I've got is, I don't know what I've got, propanone. Now the O-N-E suffix is the betrayer or a ketone. This is the reason why you know acetone is a, car is a ketone or is a, is a carbonyl, right? Because it's O-N-E, propanone. That's a ketone suffix, okay? Now, what happens though if I shift this carbonyl over one? How about, what if I shift this double bond over like to the, one of the end carbons? What, 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 how, what do I get then? Well, let's take a look at that one. So here I've got my carbon, here's my other carbon, and then I've got my carbonyl on the end now. So notice it finishes, because that carbon has four. These guys are filled with hydrogens. What is this one? This one is propanal, A-L. That's the high aldehyde. So al, A-L, is the ending suffix for an aldehyde. So notice what I did was basically take the propane backbone, I added a carbonyl in there, and depending on where I positioned that carbonyl, gave me two completely different types of molecules. One is a ketone, propanone, and the other one's an aldehyde, propanal. You said the R is for like reference that it's another type of carbon. Yeah, so the R is just some backbone. So it could be just the continuing of the chain, or it could be a, well, anything, right? <clears throat> now, why are the carbonyls important? Well, here's why they're important. Um, because of an ex of a lab that I did in organic chemistry, you guys are like, great, you're gonna, it's important to you, right? Because you did this lab in organic chemistry. No, it actually drives home the reason why these are important. But in organic chemistry, one of the things you do in organic chemistry is you do like, a, you learn chemical reactions of these functional groups, like in their chapter. And then what do you do in the lab is you go in the lab and you try to make them, right? So you try to do synthesis reactions. That's really cool, right? Because this is the lab when you have all the glassware. So you have all the round bottom flasks and all the condenser tubes. I mean, this is like when you do look like a mad scientist. You have like all this glassware everywhere. But the problem with the synthesis in organic chemistry is that a lot of times your products that you get from your reaction are all clear and odorless and you don't know what you got. You don't know if you're successful or not. So after you do a synthesis, most of the time in organic chemistry, you have to subject it to a lot of analysis. You have to send it through a lot of imaging, like um, infrared spectroscopy to try to figure out what sorts of functional groups you have on there, NMR, which is nuclear magnetism. You have all these different tests and things like that to get to test it out on, to see whether or not you actually got what you think you got. And it takes a lot of time to do that, except for this one synthesis when we got to the carbonyl. In this one, we were making two different molecules. One was a ketone, one was an aldehyde. The aldehyde was called cinnamaldehyde. So what do you think that smelled like? Cinnamon, it was a smell of cinnamon. And the other one was not a technical name, but it's, it's street name, if you will, um, was banana oil, which was a ketone. And it smelled like bananas, right? And this was the one lab where we didn't have to do a bunch of in-depth analysis after we did our synthesis, because you knew. You knew the second you got it. Why? Because the whole room smelled like cinnamon and bananas. It was really cool, right? Because it's like aromatherapy and organic chemistry. Um, so it's really cool that way. But it also drives home the point that these are two natural fragrances, right? Cinnamon is a real thing. Bananas are actually real. They smell like bananas. Like a real banana smells like banana. But this was a ketone that was the banana scent. Biologically, my chemistry friends would get this. They're like, Oh, that's cool. It's our ketone. They're all getting their nerd on about the ketone and the aldehyde, right? And I'm just sitting there blown away thinking, 
So we just basically made the natural fragrance that these plants are making to make themselves smell like bananas or to make themselves smell like cinnamon. So when you look at natural fragrances, a lot of them are ketones and aldehydes, right? So think about that when you guys get flowers or give flowers tomorrow. Oftentimes we're attracted to flowers that smell really good. Some of those fragrances are ketones and aldehydes. Right. So that's why carbonyls are important because they kind of form that biological framework. And by the way, I mean, this gets even deeper, doesn't it? I mean, things in nature don't smell good because they just want to smell good, right? Things in nature, like fragrances, floral fragrances, like ketones and aldehydes, they smell good because they're trying to do something, right? What is that flower trying to do? when it makes itself smell really good. Oh no, not bees, yes, but bees will be by sight, right? They don't have a sense of smell. Well, who are they really trying to dupe? If you go through like a nice hot, warm day through a garden and it's like one of those days where it's just like, you can just kind of smell the fragrance of the garden just coming at you, what do you oftentimes do? What? Yeah, you stop, don't you? You're like, number one, that's really pretty, right? And number two, that smells really good. I want to get a closer look at that one. What do you do? You stick that old nose down right in there, don't you? Like, I mean, you get lost in there. Roses are perfect this way, right? Because they're shaped perfectly like for our face. It's like, they're just like, like a flower squid on our face, like, like aliens, right? And so you just stick it down in there and it smells wonderful, doesn't it? And if you get a good smelling flower, I mean, you, you kind of, you hang out in there for a while, don't you? Because you're like, Ooh, that smells good. I think I'm going to just take an extra minute here and just kind of soak this in. Right. Because this flower's not going to be here forever. And then what do you do? You're like, this one over here is kind of pretty. And then what do you do? And what have you done? Yeah. You've pollen it. You've been used. You've totally been worked. The second you do that, you have been worked by the flowers. So when you get those roses or you give those roses, you look at them with squinty eyes. It's like, you're working me, aren't you? You're using me. That's true. But um, they know they're doing this for us, right? I mean, why do bananas smell yummy? By the way, I mean, most primates, including us, we, we love bananas. I mean, ask any baby. You can get a baby to eat just about anything if you mix some banana puree into it, right? I mean, it's like the number one selling baby food flavor, like by far, is bananas. Everything's got bananas in this and bananas in that, right? I mean, I mean, every mother knows this. It's a good strategy, right? It's like, if I want you to eat your peas, I mix it with bananas. Because you'll eat it for the bananas, but you'll get the peas, right? So, I mean, why? What are we doing when we eat the banana? How we do? How how's how does the plant win on that one? What's inside a banana? Plant doesn't care about that. What is the plant doing whenever it makes fruit? Yes. And by the way, bananas do have seeds, just not the ones we buy at the store because we've cultivated them to not have bananas. Wild bananas actually have seeds in them. Exactly. Again, not only are you a pollinator, but you're a seed spreader. So little primate, you love my fruit. I'm going to load it up with a bunch of sugar because I know you've got a sweet tooth. I'm going to make it smell super yummy because who doesn't love the smell of bananas? And I'm going to make it bright and yellow like nothing you've seen in the jungle. And so all of those things are appealing to your sight, your smell, and your taste. And then when you eat that fruit, it's heaven. Gotcha. Says the plant. And then of course, 
the unsuspecting little primate waddles his way down the jungle trail, takes a dump, and deposits the seeds and spreads banana dum everywhere. So every time you eat fruit, you're being worked. Every time you buy a flower, you smell a flower, you're being worked. You're being used by the plant kingdom. They're smarter than us. They're using us and we don't even know it. So who, who do you think, who do you think smarter on this planet? Animals or plants? Plants one, animals zero, right? And you know what the humbling thing is? They don't even have a nervous system. Oh, now that hurts, right? Okay, that's, uh, that's for all you botany people out there, right? Anyway. Okay, now let's take a look at a variation of the carbonyl called the carboxyl. It's carboxylic acid. In this case, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have your R group coming in your chain, carbon double bond. But in this case, instead of like another carbon chain or a hydrogen, what's gonna happen is you're gonna dump a hydroxyl group on there. This whole thing goes together as your carboxylic acid. And oftentimes it's abbreviated COOH. And the reason why it's an acid is because this terminal H right here can actually be liberated and given off to create the acid. So then it would kind of toggle back and forth between this H-less form and this H form, depending on where it is. Okay. So that terminal H is what it can give up. That's the reason why it's an acid. It actually creates acidity. I want to foil this against the next one because we'll see this actually later on. That's the amino group. The amino group is basically when you have your chain coming in, it's gonna connect it to a nitrogen and then you're gonna have hydrogens attached to it. So that's your amino group. It's a fairly alkaline group. But these two guys taken together essentially will form what's called the amino acid, which is the uh, building blocks of our proteins. And so when you take a look at the amino acid, on one side, you've got the amino group. So there's your amino. In the middle, you've got a carbon, which is what we refer to as either a central carbon or an alpha carbon. And then to this carbon is uh, going to be attached an R group where there are basically uh, 20 different options for this particular R group um, to choose from. And then we're going to bookend it with our acid group. So this side over here is the amino piece. And this is the acid piece. And then typically you have 20 different naturally occurring amino acids that are uh, composing up your, your proteins. And you have, uh, they're, they're, they're only different, by the way, in their side chain, that R group. For instance, if that R group here is, um, is, is hydrogen, it's glycine. If it's a methyl group, the way they have over here, then it's alanine. Okay. So different side chains there, different R groups will dictate which amino acid you have. And that's what makes up proteins, all of your proteins. Okay, so we tend to see those together. Um, the other one, which is very similar to uh, the hydroxyl group, is the sulfhydryl group, which is the R group. Well, in this case, instead of an oxygen, it's a sulfur with a hydrogen. So it's an SH group instead of an OH group. And if you take a look at the oxygen family, group six, you notice that all of those atoms in the vertical family, so oxygen, um, Sulfur, selenium, terillium, polonium, all of those, uh, Las Vegas I I don't know what LV is, but um, <laughs> it's not Las Vegas um, right? So all of those are in the same family, which means that because of their electronic nature, they have similar ca chemical characteristics. They're not the same, but they have similarities to them, right? Just like siblings in the same family are not the same, but there's definitely a relatedness to them, okay? Now, the importance of the sulfhydryl group is because this is the only interaction when you're folding up proteins that can form a covalent crosslink. So for instance, if you've got, in this case, they show the amino acid cysteine. So here you can see your backbone, there's your amino acid component. And then this here, CH2SH is your side chain, your R group. This actually has the ability when proteins are folding up to form a covalent crosslink, which is called a disulfide bridge. 
So for instance, if I got this sort of protein that's sort of like winding around like this, and I've got two cysteines right here, then they can form a covalent link. called a disulfide bridge. That says disulfide bridge underneath there. That helps to stabilize proteins. Because otherwise, proteins are only um, held together by hydrogen bonds. Let's take a look at the next one, the phosphate group. This is the one that you see um, in DNA and RNA, which is going to be important. That's your informational molecule. So basically, in this case, you have an R group coming in. And it's going to be bound to this complex of oxygens and phosphorus. So you have an oxygen bound to a phosphorus. To another oxygen and to one of these oxygens, the phosphorus is double bound. But all these oxygens have these negative, because um, they're highly electronegative. So they tend to have all this negativity associated with them, right? Because they're sucking all this electron cloud toward them. So oftentimes phosphates tend to be associated with negativity. They tend to be negative in nature and charge. And I typically abbreviate them as a P in a circle. Okay. And so you'll see this in nucleic acids. So you see phosphates as part of the construction of nucleic acids. The other one that we, the last one that we want to uh, talk about is the alkyl group, which is a generic term. This is basically a smaller carbon chain. Attached to a larger. So remember before in the previous slide, we had the methyl, right? We had methane, ethane, and propane, right? But what happens instead of attaching small things to these, like an ethanol, ethanol, what if these things are attached to an even bigger carbon chain? Well, if that's the case, then they become what's called an alkyl group. So they drop their suffix, ane, and they adopt yl, which means now they are a constituent. They're smaller, right? They're part of a, a larger piece. And what I want to do is I want to draw an example. So here is a large carbon chain with high priority called benzene. It's got wrote, it's got uh, alternating double bonds. This is actually one of the functional groups in organic chemistry. It's got its own chapter, its own spectrum of chemistry and its own chemical properties to it. But this is what's called benzene. And uh, to this, I want to add a couple of these carbon chains. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a methyl group. So I'm going to say, here's my methane. I'm going to draw it out here. So here's the hydrogens. So this would be methyl benzene. Let's say I draw an ethyl group here. This would be methyl ethyl benzene. Would have had two methanes to it. If it had two methanes in it, it would be like one three dimethyl benzene, or in this case, in benzenology, they have names for these positions. Um, if you're right next to each other, that's called para. If you're one away, you're ortho, um, and so forth. So this would be like ortho dimethyl benzene or ortho methyl benzene. Um, but you would have notice the name, right? So you have an attachment, methane on a larger backbone, benzene. You have another attachment, ethane on a larger backbone, which is benzene. And so this is kind of how organic chemistry works. The nomenclature of organic chemistry is very descriptive. Um, it's actually telling you what's on there. Uh, if you were to hang different types of, you know, um, um, like multiple, different types of functional groups on there, then you just start numbering them according to their carbons, right? So like if you've ever run into like a molecule, like especially insecticides, where it's like one, two, tri, nitro, methylene, diamine, tetrahydrocycle, or something like that, right? Some sort of, a, there's like a bunch of numbers in front of it. 
what they're doing is they're telling you what each of those little functional groups, which carbons are, are attached to. So it's like a little verbal map of telling you what that's attached to. But this is an example of methane, for instance, not acting like the backbone, but acting like an alkyl group. It's an attachment. It's an ornament to a bigger tree, right? So that's what it is. Okay. You guys are doing great so far in organic chemistry. So <laughs> you're like, no, we're not. Um, <laughs> right, so this is just kind of some intros. A couple more intro ideas, right? Some, uh, some issues that we run into a lot in actual um, biological molecules is isomers. So what exactly is an isomer? An isomer is a molecule that has the same molecular formula, but something different. Right, here's a good example. C6H12O6, right? What is that? Glucose, which is a good guess. However, it could also be fructose and it can also be galactose. So that's an example of three isomers of each other. One of these isomers is what's referred to as a structural isomer. That basically means it's arrangement in three dimensional, it's arranged differently. So it's still got the same number of atoms, right? So fructose has six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens, so does galactose, right? So a structural isomer basically uh, refers to the fact that these atoms are arranged differently structurally in three dimensional space, right? That's a structural isomer. Uh, stereoisomers basically refer to them being uh, different in three dimensional space. And uh, the way I want to sort of describe this is with enantiomers. So enantiomers are the easiest type of stereoisomer to understand because they're mirror images of each other. It's like right versus left, right? So your right hand versus your left hand. As a matter of fact, that's the example that they give, right? So your right hand versus your left hand. These are like enantiomers, right? They're mirror images of each other. They're not the same thing. Structurally, do they look similar? Yeah. Do they all have the same formula? Four fingers and a thumb and a palm and the back of your hand. That's true for all both of them, right? But they're not the same because they're mirror images of each other. Can you fit a right-handed glove on a left hand? No, right? Not unless you start really jacking with your hand, right? So that's proof that they're not the same, right? And so enantiomers are a type of mirror image. And we tend to sort of focus on these because they're easy for us to understand. Now there's other stereoisomers other than just enantiomers. And in organic chemistry, you get kind of all into this, um, but like there's like not every stereoisomer is an enantiomer, but enantiomers are stereoisomers. Does that make sense? What do I want? Do you want me to say that again? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not all stereoisomers are enantiomers. That means mirror images, right? There's different ways to arrange this in space, three dimensionally, that's not a mirror image. Okay, so not all stereoisomers are enantiomers, but all enantiomers are stereoisomers, right? All mirror images of each other are stereoisomers. Think of stereo like that spatial sort of thing, like you're, you're looking at three-dimensional space, right? That's kind of what stereo means. Um, and that's kind of what you're talking about. You're looking at a different look of it in three-dimensional space. Okay. Now, this gets to an organic term called chirality, which I don't want you to spend any time worrying about. Um, because this was my least favorite part of organic chemistry, to be honest with you, because I'm not a spatial person. So like when I went to OCHEM 1 and we were like doing the whole hand thing, and I mean, it was like performance art. You're like trying to figure out like three-dimensionally how everything, I mean, for somebody who's not like a spatial type of a person who doesn't see that, like it's, it's maddening um, to say the least. So I don't want to beat you guys up too much, but what's the take home biologically for this? This right here. What this basically means is that we have left-handed molecules, right? So ultimately, when you take a look at um, these molecules, you have a left-handed and a right-handed version. You know, the left-handed version of sugars is what's called D-dextrorotatory sugars and an L for amino acids. But these are all left-handed, right? L means it's left, it's not actually, it doesn't stand for left-handed. That's not what it stands for, it stands for the rotatory. But, all your amino acids are L amino acids. Everything in your body is L amino acids. The enzymes in your body are calibrated for L amino acids. 
But think of it this way, and this is one thing I really want to make sure you understand and drive home a little bit, is that when you're making uh, like an amino acid, for instance, let's take that one as an example, um, you don't have a choice to make either L or R. Okay, That's not your choice. You don't have a choice. Of that. It's like making a quarter, right? Now, forget about embossing the heads and tails on it, right? You can do whatever you want there, right? But the second you make that little silver disc, the second you make it, you've made both sides, haven't you? Is it possible to make a one-sided disc? No, the second you make it, you've got both sides, right? It doesn't really matter what you want to put on either side, but you've made it. So the same thing is also true for these molecules. If we manufacture these, the second we manufacture them, we get both right and left-handed molecules. It's like the quarter. We can't make one without the other. Now, the reason why that's important is because um, when you end up in Vitamin Cottage, AKA natural grocers, and you're scouring the shelves for an amino acid supplement and you run across a bottle that says L-tyrosine. What do they mean, L-tyrosine? How's that different than this one over here that just says tyrosine? So what they're saying is that, hey, we only have the one you can use. This guy over here who doesn't say L, half of that bottle, you can't even use. So you're paying like 60 bucks for half the product because your body can't use the right hand for once. They're, what they're also saying is that they're claiming that somehow they magically can differentiate between L and R, right and left, and they can't. They certainly can't manufacture just the L. Right? If that's what they say, then they're lying. The other alternative is, oh, no, no, we, we, make, we just kind of, we select, we have a process. It's usually always proprietary, right? Just read the fine print. It's, it's a proprietary process that we can actually enrich this for the L tyrosine. So you only get more of what you need, not the filler stuff, right? So the R tyrosine, the stuff we can't use. Well, here's the problem with that. If that was the case, then it shouldn't be proprietary, should it? Because if you were legit on that one, you would be running to the patent office and getting the patented. Once you get a patented, guess what? You don't have to say stupid things like, oh, it's proprietary because everybody in the world knows you own it and that they can't touch it unless they want to go to court. So when I see, oh, this is proprietary, I basically see liar. That's what I see. You're lying. You're selling me a bill of goods. And what you're saying is not true. And this is also, I, would, I love to pick on the supplement industry. I love it. Um, because they're full of such charlatans, snakes, and snake oil salesmen. Um, they're absolutely diabolical. They should probably be burned at the stake, um, most of them. Because most of what you see in vitamin supplement is mostly marketing and bullshit. There's a little bit of legit stuff in there, but it gets lost in the wash of nonsense. And the problem is there's a good stuff in there, but it just it's too hard to figure out what the good stuff is. It's just impossible, right? So that basically is what that means is the other, supposedly you're getting the L-tyrosine, the one that you can use. Okay, so just remember that. I'm not saying don't go buy your supplements. I'm just saying you've got a lot of work to do because they're not gonna do it for you, right? They're not, they have no reason to come clean with that. It's easier for them to basically make some sort of a false claim because there's gonna be enough people who buy it than for them to actually be legit. That's a little brutal, <clears throat> but that's absolutely straight up. That's how it works. That's the reason why, by the way, we have the FDA. For all of its bureaucracy and slushiness, that's the reason why we have the FDA, is to make sure that, you know, when a pharmaceutical comes our way, that it actually is going to help us, not either waste our money or worse yet, kill us. Okay because that's exactly what the pharmaceutical industry would look like if the FDA didn't exist. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our molecules, right? So we have our four major macromolecule groups, our carbohydrates, our lipids, our proteins, and our nucleic acids. 
And so what we want to do basically is we want to start defining some things here. First of all, all of these molecules, macromolecules are built for, with a similar pattern. So first of all, they all start with a monomer, which is typically a single subunit um, in this particular um, group, right? And then you want to build a polymer. So this is basically a series of monomers linked together. So the, reason, the, the example that I like to use here, the analogy I like to use here is of a brick wall, right? So what's the monomer in the brick wall system? A single brick, right? Are all bricks the same? No, you have lots of different bricks, right? So if you're going to be building a brick wall, a good mason is has master uh, has a mastery of the different types of materials that they can build this brick wall with, right? And different materials will give you different types of brick walls. So the polymer then, of course, would be the brick wall. So this is basically how you build macromolecules. You start off with a small fundamental brick-like monomer molecule, and then you basically link them together the same way you do with a brick wall, right? Building brick walls is not difficult. Um, it's probably one of the easiest, easiest uh, masonry things to do. Why? Because we've largely been building brick walls since we were like in diapers in one way or another. Anybody who's ever played with blocks is essentially learning the fundamentals of brick wall building. <laughs> right. So, I mean, there's nothing magical to it. Um, you just kind of sophisticate it up a little bit more when you're a mason, right? So you can do more things with it. So this is basically for you table people. I'm not going to spend time here. This is the entire chapter, right? So this is basically like a little table of contents of everywhere this chapter is going to go and all the different macromolecules we're going. So this is like one of those organizers. So when you're trying to index your knowledge, trying to pull everything together so it kind of makes sense, this is a good tool to use to help organize and sort of outline everything that we're gonna be going through, okay? So make use of it. Okay, so let's start off then with um, our process. There we go. So we have our bricks, yes? We have a wall that we're trying to build, but guess what? You don't just start throwing bricks in a pile, do you? There's a mechanism or a process, right? There's a procedure for building the brick wall, isn't there? So what do you do first? Yep, you kind of build the base, right? You start laying down that base, that foundation brick, right? Because ultimately, if that's not sound and well-structured, then the rest of the brick wall is going to be a little tricky, right? So you lay that down. And then what do you slather on top of that row? when you go to add the next. Some mortar, right, of different types. I mean, there's different types of mortar for masonry that you can use, but basically it's a cement base, right? So, and then what do you do? You add the next brick, one brick at a time, yes? And none of that, but there's a procedure that you do it with, don't you? Most brick walls are staggered, right? Why do you stagger the bricks? Yeah, stronger, right? Because if you if you line them up, what's going to happen to your brick wall? It's going to fracture like right down the middle of that seam, isn't it? It's going to kind of fall apart. By staggering it, it, it reduces your fracture. So if it fractures down between two bricks, it's not going to, it's going to hit the next brick. So it's not going to continue all the way throughout. It, usually when you see the zigzag fracture, that means it's, it's taken some punishment, right? So there's there's, it will, it will fracture, right? But it's, it's gonna be much easier to do a fresh cleave straight down the middle of that brick wall if you have them all like lined up like that, right? That's the reason why you don't do that. And then, so what do you do? You add the brick, you lay some mortar, add a brick, lay some mortar, add a brick, lay some mortar. So what you have is not, you have the monomers, you have a procedure to connect these monomers together to build your polymer. So what we're talking about now in this slide is the procedures to connect these monomers together. And as you might just suspect, it's a couple of reactions. So first reaction that you have is the builder. This is the dehydration synthesis. And this is what we have down here at the bottom. So here we're gonna do an example of a dehydration synthesis. This is basically you're building your polymer. So here is your polymeric chain. So in this case, you notice you have two individuals in this growing chain and you wanna add a third. So here's what happens. 
generally speaking, there is a protein involved in this process. And what's gonna happen is this protein is gonna come in here and it's gonna cut this bond here. And then it's going to cut this bond here. Notice what the monomer has. It has a hydrogen on one side, a hydroxyl on the other. That's necessary. Every single monomer that we see from here on out through the chapter has to have the same sort of a thing. Those are critical components. Now, what happens as soon as I break these bonds? Are these guys happy? This guy's not happy anymore, right? Why? Because that bond was what was keeping his octet rule satisfied, right? Now he's very unhappy. This guy, is he happy? No. Same thing, right? That OH group was what was keeping his octet rule happy. So now he's unhappy because you just basically broke my bonds. Not only that, but hydroxyl and hydrogen are also unhappy, aren't they? They're like, dude, I had it. I had it covered. And you just screwed me up. So here's what the enzyme does. Say, okay, fine. Listen, relax. Hydrogen, meet hydroxyl. I want you guys go leave his water. Be happy. So now these guys are happy because they've been reestablished in terms of their octet coverage, right? They've complemented each other. But guess what? Your monomer's still unhappy, isn't it? Your polymer's still unhappy, isn't it? So now the enzyme says, okay, now that I've taken care of water, now it's time for me to take care of you guys. Polymer, why don't you meet monomer and form a bond? And once you do that, you've linked that third one onto the growing <laughs> chain and now everybody is happy. And what was two has now become three. You would add a fourth, do the same thing. And what's three becomes four. And what's four becomes five and then six and seven for as long as you want this chain. That's dehydration synthesis. So that's building the polymer. Ah, but for every forward reaction, there is a reverse reaction, right? So in this particular case, if we have our monomer and we just built our polymer, this is our dehydration. What if we want to break our polymer down into our monomer? This is hydrolysis. Hydro, which means water. Lysis, which means to cut. So lysis, lytic, means to cut. So this is water cutting. So you basically use water to cut or break the bonds. Again, another enzyme over here is involved. So notice you're starting off with the polymer. All three of these guys are happy, yes? Until the enzyme comes along uses water, breaks this bond, breaks the water bond, and then reassigns them. Listen, unhappy polymer, why don't you grab onto the H that I just took off of water? Unhappy monomer, why don't you grab the OH that I just took off of water? And now what happens? What was three has now become two. And now you have a monomer. And you could use this for biology. Like for instance, maybe you want to use this to get energy from it. And you can send that off to have energy produced from it. But notice the reversibility of this reaction. In the forward reaction, monomers are being built into polymers by the dehydration synthesis. The flip side of that, polymers are being broken down into monomers by hydrolysis. They're a package deal. You get one and the other at the same time, right? Just like a switch has both an on and an off. It's not an on and an on or an off and an off. It's an on and an off. So one is forward, the other one's back. If you need to store stuff, you can basically do dehydration synthesis. If you need to pop some of that stuff off and use it, then you can go through hydrolysis. These are the two fundamental mechanisms. This is essentially the chemical version of putting mortar on the brick and connecting them together, or what's the reverse of the mortar situation? You can cut through the, you can't cut the mortar out, right? It's not easy, but I mean, you can do that if you want to, right? If a good demo crew, if they don't wanna just obliterate the bricks, they wanna salvage the bricks, they can cut through the mortar 
and they can cut the mortar out and they can actually salvage the bricks themselves, right? That would be like hydrolysis. Okay, let's take a look at carbohydrates. So in carbohydrates, basically what we have is um, a molecule that has a common one to two to one ratio of carbon hydrogen oxygen. We saw that, didn't we? Right? C6, H12, O6, one to two to one. That's a very common carbohydrate formula. And so oftentimes that, those numbers may change, but ultimately that's that you have a carbohydrate on your hands when you're doing that. The other thing about carbohydrates is they're rich in carbon hydrogen bonds. What does that mean? It means they're a very, very good energy source. They're a good source of energy. Um, an example of that, for instance, would be sugars, right? Uh, starches and glucose. Now, let me, let me just kind of mention one thing, first of all, that I have a pet peeve. Now, I don't always try to, um, I don't, I'm not always perfect at this one, but I always try to limit my use of this term right here. Why, you might ask. Well, here's a good example. If I asked you, I want you to go out into the world and bring back some sugar or sugars, make a plural. What would you come back with? Okay, the bag of just white sugar, baking sugar, right? Would anybody come back with something different? Fruit, that's got a lot of sugar in it, that's true. Maple syrup, right? The corn syrup idea, right? So that's sugar. Cookies, that's got a lot of sugar in it. Different types of sugar, right? What? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Notice there's a lot of different variations on this theme. Huh? How many of you guys didn't pick the obvious one? Candy. It's because it's not Halloween yet. So. <laughs> right? Yeah, right, the big, yeah, the big candy holidays. Um, so basically you guys came back with something different. Were you guys wrong? No, if I don't define what I mean, right? I mean, some of you guys came back with a big old bag. I'm like, oh, that's not what I was looking, at, looking for. Uh, some of you guys might come back with like a, a drink, right? That has a lot of sugar in it as part of its energy. I'm not saying that one, but, but like some of these are just like, they're sugar bombs is what they are. That's the reason why they give you energy. <laughs> Right, so something like that. Some of you guys may come back with candy, but unless I actually explain to you, okay, wait a minute, what I'm doing is I'm baking. So the bag of sugar was what I was looking for. Yes, syrup has sugar in it, that's great, but I don't wanna cook with that one. Candy has sugar in it, but I don't wanna cook with that one, right? So I have to be specific about what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. I could have been more specific. It's my error that I wasn't. That's the reason why I got half the grocery store coming back at me, right? But the thing, same thing is true for this term right here. This is what I call an old world term. So an old generation term. Older scientists um, oftentimes use this. I can actually usually, there's a couple of terms in science that I can tell how old you are or that you learned your biology from an old person. Is This is one of those, right? And it drives me crazy. This drives me crazy. Um, a little bit. Now, there's sometimes when I, I do use it uh, because there's not a, a decent, uh, clear uh, alternative, right? But here's a good example. If I ask you, are you going to be checking your sugars? What am I asking you? Yeah, and who am I talking to? A diabetic usually, right? So here's the problem I have with that. No, just for Joe Average, that's fine, right? Because Joe Average doesn't really care about any of the rest of them. But when you're talking about science, it's like, um, which sugars? You've got a lot of different sugars, carbohydrates in your body. Technically speaking, they're all sugars, right? Is all you have in your body glucose? No, you've got fructose in there. You've got galactose in there. You've got mannose in there. You've got maltose in there. You've got all kinds of things in there. So which one are you talking about? If I asked you, you know, go check your sugars. It's like, no, 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 no. I know what I'm asking. I'm asking about glucose specifically. So oftentimes with the term sugars is instead of using the generic term, which is sugars, use the specific term. So if I know we're talking about glucose, then typically talk about glucose because it's not the same as all the rest of them, right? And so that's one of my big sticklers in nomenclature. Oftentimes I don't like it 
when a term is non-descriptive, if there's a descriptive alternative, it's like you need to use that. Because if you know you're interested in glucose, then you need to say glucose okay. at all possible. Uh, starch, for instance, um, starch is kind of similar. There's not all starches are the same, but it's not quite as bad as sugars. Um, technically speaking, everything in the carbohydrate world can fall into the term sugar, um, everything, which is not good enough, right? Um, it's like going to a, a black tie convention that's like 10,000 people strong and asking, go find the guy in the tux. It's like, which one of the 10,000? I mean, a little more information, right? So if you know which guy, give me his name, you know? <laughs> How about that one? Give me his name. And if he's at a black tie event, give me his money. But anyway, because um, <laughs> I obviously will never be, I'm not important, will ever be important enough to be to, to one of those things. And even if I was, I probably wouldn't go. I was like, listen, you said black tie. You didn't say anything about jeans, right? So I'm just saying all that interpretation. But anyway, okay, let's talk about the monomers, shall we? So we uh, get down to the monosaccharides. These are the simplest of all of the carbohydrates. And so this basically is um, um, a six carbon sugar and we have our C6H12O6, right? But this can also be fructose, which is actually a structural isomer of glucose. And we'll see that here in just a second. It can also be galactose. Galactose is the stereoisomer of glucose. So we'll actually see what we mean by that as well. And then the reason why this is important is because the enzymes that work on glucose will not work on fructose. The ones that work on galactose will not work on glucose. So each one of these has its own specific enzyme that works on itself, okay? Notice the other thing that's betraying carbohydrates is they all have an O-S-E suffix. That O-S-E suffix tells you you're dealing with a, a, some sort of a carbohydrate. Think about it. Sucrose, basic table sugar, right? Mannose, maltose, glucose, fructose dextrose, right? sucralose. So those are all carbohydrates when they have that OSE ending on them. Um, typically anything with an OSE ending is a carbohydrate, but not all carbohydrates have an OSE ending, right? Like uh, polyethylene glycol, for instance, is kind of carbohydrate-ish, but it doesn't have, or um, erythritol, that's a common sweetener that we're seeing now as, a, as an alternative to corn syrup and other types of uh, sweeteners. But that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a carbohydrate, but it doesn't have um, the OSE ending. So not all o, uh, carbohydrates have an OSE ending, not like pectin, for instance, right? that's another one. So this one here, I just wanna sort of sketch out a little bit <clears throat> about what we're seeing here. And then I, I wanna do the heavy lifting on this one next time. But this is showing you a spectrum of all the different carbohydrates that we're gonna see. So you have some that are three carbon carbohydrates like glyceraldehyde, for instance, which is a component of lipids. So we'll see that in the lipid section. Um, five carbon sugars come in the form of ribose and deoxyribose, which is basically RNA and DNA. So we'll see these two guys come back to us in the nucleic acid section. The six carbon carbohydrates are the ones we deal with in metabolism, for instance, right? So glucose, for instance, and fructose and galactose are all six carbon. Now notice, this is where I want you to see the difference between the structural versus the stereoisomer. These two are structural isomers of each other. Notice they're both C6H12O6, yes? But you notice they're structured differently. Fructose is basically a home plate, whereas glucose is a hexagonal ring. So that's what I mean by structural isomer. Galactose is a stereoisomer in the sense that it's both a six-membered ring, but what's the difference? The placement of the hydroxyl group. Think about it. Let's take a look at the, the ring. So the OH group placed up here is above the ring. This is below the ring. So when you take a look at the OH groups, galactose is up, down, up, up. Glucose is down, down, up, down. That's it. That's the only difference. As a matter of fact, there's an entire spectrum of similar types of carbohydrates where they only differ by the placement of their OH groups. And in biochemistry, I had to memorize all of them. So it'd be like up, up, down, down, up, 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 down, 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 up, up, 
up, up, up, up, down, 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 down. I mean, and there's like a whole bunch of them. And this is where I learned to hate carbohydrate biochemistry. This is one of the reasons why I got off the biochemistry wagon away into molecular biology. It's because I wasn't interested in fussing around with all of that, especially if half of them aren't biologically relevant to us. Okay. So the other thing I want to do is I want to talk about the numbering system. But before I let you guys go, let's draw a cutoff, shall we? The cutoff for the exam will not be this. It'll be up to the end and including um, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So exam two will begin with the discussion about carbohydrates moving forward. Okay, so we'll have, so the next exam should have all four of the macromolecules, the rest of chapter three, and then however far we get in four, wherever we end up. So that makes sense? Yeah. So, um, uh, yes, Kenna, the cutoff is including hydrolysis up to the end of including hydrolysis. Um, typically, the first 50 are multiple choice. Um, after that is probably about another, it ranges maybe a good 10-ish or so, short answer, things like that. Generally speaking, the exam is split uh, kind of 80-20, roughly, 80% multiple choice, 20% other stuff. Uh, usually short essay uh, question. Um, yes, short answer written and then multiple choice kind of to answer your question. So that, uh, hopefully that helps. So you know the answer's there somewhere, <laughs> at least for the, for the multiple choice part. Okay. okay. I will see you guys on Wednesday.